Thank you. And with that, <laughs> you got it. And with that, we'll get started. <clears throat> please, please help me welcome our speaker for the morning, Dr. Stephen M. Kahn, director of the Vera C. Rubin Observatory and the Cassius Lamb Kirk Professor in the Natural Sciences and Professor of Particle Physics and Astrophysics at Stanford University. Prior to joining the faculty at Stanford in 2003, he served as the I.I. Rabi Professor of Physics and Chair of the Department of Physics at Columbia University. Dr. Khan has undertaken a diverse program of research in experimental, observational, and theoretical astrophysics. He has specialized in X-ray spectroscopy of astrophysical sources. He has held director and deputy director positions at the Cavity Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology and at the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. Having graduated summa cum laude in 1975 from Columbia University, Stephen Kahn completed his PhD in physics at UC Berkeley in 1980. He holds fellowships with the American Physical Society, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Academy of Sciences, and a whole lot of other things that I couldn't fit in to this brief introduction. Professor Khan, welcome to the Greenway Talks online at Palomar Observatory. It's a pleasure to have you with us, and thank you for taking the time to speak to the Greenway audience this morning. <clears throat> we'll take questions at the end. Right now, I'm gonna ask everyone to turn off their microphones. And with that, Professor Kahn, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Steve. Thanks very much for inviting me to do this. And I really appreciate the opportunity to address all of you, uh, all of you about the project that I'm working on. So let me start by seeing if I can share screen. Uh, you can probably see that. Um, and I'll bring it up. Cool. Oh. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk to you. I've titled this talk Surveying the Universe. Um, and uh, that's literally what we're doing. It's a fairly simple concept. Uh, that we've carried out um, to its really uh, its uh, uh, ultimate uh, ultimate conclusion, as we'll show you in a minute. Um, the the notion of doing astronomy by conducting surveys uh, is really a sea change in in the way we think about doing astronomy, and the idea goes back um, now a couple of decades actually. Uh, so prior to that, uh, we mostly, as uh, astronomers and astrophysicists, we mostly pointed our telescopes at individual stars and galaxies uh, in an attempt to try to understand what's happening in each of these individual systems. Uh, but the newer approaches are attempting to take very large surveys of the entire sky. Uh, the pioneering program in, in this area was called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which was constructed in the late 90s. And it began doing observations in the early 2000s. There have been a number of other surveys since, including the Zwicky Transient Factory, which I understand you heard a talk uh, from Matt Graham uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, but the ultimate project uh, in this vein is uh, the one I'll describe today that we call the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. And as I hope you'll see by the end of the talk, the data that we will acquire are likely to transform nearly all fields of astronomy for our, from our understanding of the solar system to the structure and evolution of the universe as a whole. 
So let me just start with a couple of comments about Vera Rubin. Her full name is Vera Florence Cooper Rubin. And unfortunately, she passed away a few years ago in 2016. Uh, actually, the idea of naming the observatory after her predated her death. Um, those of you who may know about Vera Rubin, she was a pioneering female astronomer whose work provided some of the most convincing evidence that we have for the existence of dark matter. Dark matter is one of the great mysteries of modern physics. Uh, we now know that it is the dominant form of matter in the universe, uh, but we also know that it's fundamentally distinct from all the matter that we are familiar with here on Earth and that we've made in our large accelerator facilities. In particular, it does not interact with ordinary matter. So according to our understanding, there are uh, large uh, fluxes of dark matter particles which are passing through your bodies uh, as we speak, but you don't know of their existence because they don't interact with any of the atoms in your body. And so there's no effect. The only reason we know of the existence of dark matter is through its gravitational forces. Um, like ordinary matter, it exerts gravitational attractive forces on everything else, um, but it doesn't interact by any of the other known forces in nature, electromagnetism or the weak and strong nuclear forces. We really have no understanding of what dark matter actually is. As I mentioned, it remains one of the great mysteries of modern physics. So Vera's work um, was well recognized during her lifetime, uh, but she never received the Nobel Prize, uh, which many of us believe she richly deserved. And um, as, as you may have noticed, there's sort of a dearth of great female scientists who've been awarded with the Nobel Prize, and, and that's probably not accidental. In fact, Vera was, um, one of her other passions was advancing the careers of women scientists. And she herself, uh, uh, you know, really pursued her passion uh, despite a number of obstacles that came in her way as, as she proceeded. Um, the Vera C. Rubin Observatory is actually the first major national scientific facility named after a woman. So uh, after, in particular, women scientists. So we're very proud to carry that name. So what is the Rubin Observatory? Well, the idea is actually extremely simple. Uh, we build a very large telescope that can take large format digital images of the sky very quickly. Uh, and that enables us to uh, image the entire Southern hemisphere of sky uh, in just a few nights. And then we do that repeatedly, um, just continuously for 10 years. So over the course of those 10 years, we'll have something like a thousand pictures, um, high sensitivity pictures of every part of the Southern sky. And the scientific implications for that database are really quite profound. We'll measure everything that moves in the sky, asteroids, comets, stellar parallax, proper motion. We'll measure everything that varies in time in the sky, including stellar variations, stellar explosions like supernovae and active galactic nuclei. And if you take those thousand exposures and you add them back together, we'll actually measure everything in the sky. Um, we will construct some of the deepest images ever taken over the whole sky. And we're expecting that we will catalog something like 20 billion galaxies and a comparable number of stars, about 17 billion stars. It'll be the first time in human history that we know of many more objects in the universe than there are people on Earth. So everybody in the world can be handed, you know, a few galaxies and a few stars to call their own, and they can pay attention to the characteristics of those objects. So this is also a, a remarkable facility for public engagement with science. So what, why, what's unique about the Rubin Observatory? Why is that different than, than other observatories? And the key figure is what, what astronomers and optical scientists call the etat du, uh, which is a French word. And it refers to the product of the collecting area of the primary mirror and the field of view of the camera. Uh, so that's illustrated here. 
Uh, the Rubin Observatory primary, primary mirror, and I'll go into more detail about this later, is about 8.4 meters in diameter. And it's, it's actually an annulus, as you'll see here. It has a large hole in the middle. Now, on the same peak in Chile, there's a, another national facility called the Gemini South Telescope. It also has an 8.4 meters uh, mirror. So there's nothing particularly unique about that. And as you know, there are larger telescopes in the world, like the Keck Observatories, which are 10 meters. Um, but on this same scale, or on a comparable scale, we show on the right the field of view of the largest imaging camera on the Gemini South Telescope. And again, on the same scale is the field of view of the Rubin Observatory camera. And it's the product of these two quantities which determines how quickly you can survey or take images across the sky. And so you can see that um, for Rubin Observatory, that number is very large because of the field of view of the camera. Um, it's roughly the Aton due of the Rubin Observatory is about 10 times higher than any other facility in the world. And it's actually 10 times higher than any facility that anybody is even thinking of building in the world. So it's really, uh, it's really a unique, uh, world unique facility that, that we are constructing. And just to get an idea of the content of this database, uh, this is a simulated image uh, that we produce with the Rubin Observatory. We have a high fidelity uh, simulation tool uh, that makes very realistic images of the sky and accounts for all of the engineering effects in, in the telescope and the camera. So if you look at this image, you can see how dense it is. Um, in fact, most of the objects that you're seeing are galaxies, not stars. We get deep enough in our images that we're essentially seeing out of the galaxy and most of the field is uh, uh, of, out of the Milky Way. Most of the field that we see is in stars. But this particular picture is one two hundredth of the full Rubin Observatory field. And this is a simulation for a 15 second exposure. So you can imagine that every 15 seconds, we get an image this deep, 200 times bigger. And we just will take nearly 2000 such exposures uh, over the course of the 10 years of every part of the southern sky. So it's an enormously rich database. And you know, one of the great things about the Rubin Observatory that got me uh, interested in this idea in the beginning is just the fact that we can do that, that we can actually chart a major fraction of the universe uh, uh, at this stage in, uh, in human civilization. In fact, it, it's kind of interesting. I mentioned earlier that we'll get about 20 billion galaxies in the catalog. That's actually about 10% of all the galaxies in the observable universe. Because as we look further out in space, of course, we're looking further back in time. And eventually we go far enough back in time that there were no galaxies. So the total number of galaxies in the observable universe is a finite number. It's about 200 billion. And we'll see 20% of that. That's just a truly amazing thing to me that we have the capability to, to collect such data. So why is this hard? It's kind of an obvious idea. Why hasn't it been done before? And th there are a number of technical challenges um, which we started to have the capability to meet uh, at the beginning of the uh, early, uh, early 20s, uh, early 2000s. So first off, we need a really good site. We need one with good seeing and a high percentage of cloud-free nights distributed evenly over the year. Many good astronomical sites uh, have cloudy seasons and that prevents you from doing deep surveys over certain parts of the sky. So we, we were looking for a site that really had a pretty even distribution of cloud-free nights. And as you'll see, we found that in Northern Chile. Uh, we needed to invent a new kind of optical system that could deliver a large collecting area with a very large field of view. I showed you a, a kind of illustration of the field of view in the previous view graph. 
previous slide. Um, our field of view of the, ca the camera for the Rubin Observatory is, is 10 square degrees. That's 40 times the size of the full moon in the sky. So if you imagine looking up at the moon on a, on a night when the moon is full and drawing a circle 40 times bigger than the moon, uh, that's a single picture with a Rubin Observatory. And as I say, we do that every 15 seconds. Now, because we're taking so many pictures and we're doing them over large fields, we are rapidly slewing this telescope all the time. So we needed to invent a new kind of telescope mount, which was capable of rapidly slewing to new points in the sky without wasting time settling after each motion. Uh, conventional telescopes can slew across the sky, but you typically have to wait uh, a while for the telescope to settle down before you start the next exposure. Uh, for the Rubin Observatory, we set a requirement that we'd be able to slew and settle within five seconds. And then we needed to figure out how to build the largest digital camera ever constructed. Our camera has 3.2 billion pixels. It's equivalent to about 1,500 of the highest resolution, high definition TVs. So if you, for example, wanted to display at full resolution one of our 15 second images from Rubin, it would take you 1500 HD TVs to just display that. And then, uh, as you can imagine, we produce an enormous amount of data. So we needed to figure out how to process, archive, and store enormous amounts of data. And over the 10 years, the full database that Ruben will acquire will be a few hundred petabytes. A petabyte is 10 to the 15 bytes. So a few hundred is a few times 10 to the 17. That's far more data than everything that's ever been written in human history. Uh, a more interesting number is, you know, how does it compare to all the cell phone pictures that all the individuals in the world have taken since the history of the cell phone. And we're about a few percent of that database. Now, you know, we're in the era of big information, big data. So this itself is no longer as unique as we thought it would be. But the challenge is not just acquiring the data and storing them. The challenge is finding anything in those data. And that really kind of, um, uh, was a problem for many of the technologies for database storage, data querying, et cetera, that existed. So we had to invent new techniques there as well. So let me just go into a few characteristics of what the observatory will look like. It's sited in central Chile on a peak which is called Serra Pachon. Uh, that's not a new astronomical site. Um, on a map of Chile, it's shown down here. And actually on the same peak as this Gemini South telescope that I showed you earlier. And, and that's an eight meter. And then there's a four meter telescope SOAR, which is also on that site. So this is a property which is owned and operated by ORA, the Association of Universities for Research and Astronomy, uh, which is the contractor organization for the telescope uh, from the National Science Foundation. Uh, and so this is a well-developed site in a well-developed plot of land. Um, it's about 100 kilometers from the nearest coastal city, uh, La Serena, which is where we base our offices and our, our facility. There's about 50 kilometers of paved road getting to the gate and the Aura compound and about 40 kilometers of dirt road to get up to the summit at Serra Pachon where, where our telescope is. This is what it currently looks like. This picture was taken uh, less than a month ago. Um, the um, Rubin Observatory facility is shown here on the left. And this other dome, which you can see, is actually also part of the Rubin Observatory. So this dome houses a 1.3 meter telescope, which we use for calibration. So while the, the big telescope is taking images of the sky, uh, this smaller calibration telescope is taking spectra of known stars uh, in the direction. So we can calibrate the detailed transmission properties of the atmosphere at the time of, those, of that exposure. And the reason we do this is because the science we hope to get out of Rubin is very sensitive to the calibration, how well we understand the photometry, how well we can calibrate how bright the stars and galaxies are in the particular 
wavelength band that we've made the image, uh, and also the astrometry, the positions of individual stars and objects. To get an idea of the size of this facility, you can see this, this sort of little black rectangle here. That's a typical eight foot doorway. So a person on this image would be essentially hard to see to make out would look like an ant. So it's a very large facility. Uh, those of you who've been to telescopes and it sounds like most of you have had, you have, you'll notice this is a somewhat um, odd shape for an observatory. Why does it look that way? And the reason is we, we took advantage of this site. So this particular ridge on the other side of the ridge is a big drop. And so this ridge is really the first thing that the incoming winds see as they approach this mountain. Uh, and so we, we built the building after a lot of detailed modeling to take advantage of the uh, prevailing wind conditions. So we get essentially laminar flow in the wind until it hits the dome, hits the telescope. Uh, and that gives us really very good seeing images. Uh, we don't get turbulence until downstream behind the telescope. So the wind comes in straight, we get laminar flow, very good seeing, and then you get a lot of turbulence, turbulence down. And so, and so we built the building such that all the energy dissipation in the building occurs downstream. And again, leading to very pristine, very clean images at the telescope itself. So I mentioned we had to invent a new kind of optical system in order to, to do this project, in order to get this very large field with a large collecting mirror. And the design we came up with is called a modified Paul Baker optical design. Uh, it's actually a three bounce system. So the incoming light comes in and impinges on the primary mirror, which is an annulus, and then is reflected up to a large uh, concave, a uh, convex uh, secondary, uh, which you can see here. This is three and a half meters. And the light is nearly recolumated onto a tertiary uh, and then reflected on into the camera, which sits near the prime focus. It's not a prime focus, but it sits up there. And there are three transmissive lenses in the camera. So the tertiary in this system is actually five meters in diameter. So that's comparable to Palomar. So that's how large this system is. And you, you need these three bounces in order to limit aberrations, to take out spherical aberration, coma, and astigmatism uh, over this 10 square degree field of view. So that was the challenge and that's what we obtained. And in fact, the three bounces themselves give you nearly, give you essentially an, uh, an aberration-free field. The reason we have additional lenses in the system is because we use um, cooled electronic sensors, charge coupled devices, uh, and we have to keep them in an evacuated enclosure. There needs to be an entrance window into that cryostat, into that evacuated chamber. And the entrance window would introduce chromatic aberrations, which depend on wavelength or color. So these additional very large lenses, which actually turn out to be the largest lenses, lenses ever fabricated for a camera like this, are there mean, merely to take out those residual chromatic aberrations uh, that are associated with, with coming into a vacuum enclosure. So you may notice in this previous picture that the primary and the tertiary are close together. They're nearly coplanar. And so we made a decision early on that we could actually fabricate both figures out of the same glass monolith. This is the first time this has actually ever been done. Um, we did this um, uh, uh, at the Stewart Observatory Mirror Laboratory, um, which has uh, built a number of other eight meter monolithic mirrors. Uh, and this is the, the a picture that was taken while the fabrication was going on, while the polishing was going on. And you can see here the, um, um, the discontinuity between the primary and the tertiary. 
This is the first time um, this sort of two distinct figures have been fabricated in a uh, using this borosilicate technology that the University of Arizona developed. And it was very challenging. It was unclear that we could do it at the beginning. And the reason is, if you build these two figures into the same optic, then you have to ensure through the fabrication that they're coaxial. And the tolerance on that is sort of less than a millimeter, uh, whereas the total mirror is about eight meters across. So you can see how challenging that is. Normally, uh, one has the freedom to articulate mirrors after they're fabricated and do the final alignment and adjustment. But here we had to build it into the part. So, so this is the first time this ever had been done. It also involved um, removing a fair amount of glass from the original substrate, which was unusual for this technology. Um, but fortunately, we got started on that very early uh, using private funding and we were able to complete that way ahead of time. Uh, this is a photograph of the secondary mirror, um, the um, uh, convex secondary mirror, which has already been coded now in our coding facility and is stored at our facility in Chile. Uh, and this mirror was made by Harris Corporation uh, in New York, was also quite challenging to build. Um, in terms of getting the precision figure um, in a convex element like this. Now, I mentioned that we needed a telescope design that was um, very stiff so that we can slew around the sky very quickly and settle very quickly. This is a CAD drawing uh, that we had produced a number of years ago, of what we we're trying to build, and you can see how stiff it is. It looks more like a soccer ball than it does like a typical observatory, which is, is long. So this is a very fast optical system. And this shows the completed construction of the telescope mount. Um, it was a Spanish company called Astro Pieto uh, that we, was under contract to us to build this to our design. Uh, and they fully assembled the telescope and tested it in uh, their, uh, their warehouse facility in Spain and then completely dismantled it, shipped it across the Atlantic, and we're in the process of uh, reconstructing it on the mountain in Chile, and that's underway now, as I'll come to later. Uh, as I mentioned, that uh, the 8.4 meter primary tertiary mirror was fabricated in Tucson in Arizona, uh, then shipped um, uh, through the Panama Canal to Chile, trucked up to the mountain, this shows the transport of that mirror, which took about three days because they were driving at something like two miles an hour. And we now have this safely, safely stored at the summit facility, but it has not yet been inserted into the telescope mount. So let me talk a little bit about the camera. As I mentioned, it's 3.2 billion pixels. Uh, we designed and fabricated this camera at Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. Uh, in Palo Alto or Menlo Park, California. Uh, it's part of Stanford University. Um, this is a schematic of the focal plane. So each of these blue squares that you see is a 4K by 4K charge couple device. And so we had to assemble all of these to make up the 3.2 billion pixels. And we did that in a modular arrangement. So we grouped three by three of the detectors into one of these red squares, which we call a raft. And every raft has all of the readout electronics through digitization in the footprint of the sensors. And then we build these rafts as building blocks and position them together on the focal plane. The full focal plane is about 60 some odd centimeters across. And the flatness requirements to achieve the focus are at the level of around 10 microns. So we had to develop very flat CCDs and we had to develop uh, high precision metrological techniques to both produce these very flat rafts and then to align the rafts in the assembly. And this shows a design of what one of the rafts looks like. So there are nine CCDs at the top. You can see all the custom electronic readout boards that are all in the footprint of this raft so that we can put neighboring ones next to each other without gaps in the focal plane. 
And this shows one of the early graphs that we produced. It's faced upside down at this time, at this point, but the sensor is at the bottom. So we completed the full assembly of the, of the focal plane in the fall of 2019. We actually acquired um, sensors. These, these are new kinds of CCDs that had never been uh, built before. Our requirements were stricter than anything that anybody had produced. Uh, and we had two separate vendors that produced them. One is uh, E2V, which is a, a company in the UK that is known for making astronomical CCDs. And the other is um, something called the Imaging Technology Laboratory, which is located in Tucson. You can see the slightly different colors of the two different kinds of sensors in this focal plan. Uh, the raft assembly was a long, arduous process in getting them into each other. Um, this is kind of like parking a, a car in an indoor parking lot. Um, with you know about a centimeter of clearance between the two, two cars next to each other. And if these sensors were to touch each other while we were installing them, we would destroy the sensors, the, the two center sensors which touch. And they're around $100,000 each. So that was something that really we had to be very careful about. But we were successful in this effort. And one of the first things we did uh, with the fully assembled camera was to take a picture of a vegetable. <laughs> we constructed a kind of makeshift pinhole camera and we took a picture of something called a Romanescu broccoli. And the reason we chose this particular image is uh, if you've never seen one of these, uh, these broccolis, um, they're very interesting. They have a, a kind of a fractal structure to them. So there's structure on many different scales, the overall scale of the broccoli itself. And then you can, you know, you can focus down and, and see this detailed structure on small and smaller scale. So it was a good thing to take an image of. And uh, you can see that picture here. This got a fair amount of press, as you can imagine, that this, this very expensive astronomical camera is being used to, to photograph broccoli. Um, this shows an image of the large refractive lenses we fabricated. As I mentioned, these are the largest lenses in the world. Um, and it was, a, it was a real chore to design them and fabricate them, but that's all completed and they've achieved all their optical properties. And we have an elaborate, we have six different filters that we use on this camera, five of which are resonant in the camera at any given time. And so there's a complex um, mechanism, a filter changer, it was actually uh, built by our French collaborators um, at the Institute of Nuclear and Particle Physics in France. Uh, and this shows them installing that unit into the camera body. Gives you an idea of the physical dimensions of this camera. It's about the size of, a, of an SUV, the entire camera. I mentioned we have very large data rates. And um, so one of the challenges is, you know, how to get these data out of Chile and into the US. And um, an aspect of that is that part of the science, and I'll come back to this later, is to detect things that change in brightness and to issue alerts to the community that an object has changed in brightness. And we set a requirement on ourselves that within 60 seconds of closing the shutter in Chile, we would have transmitted the images back to our processing facilities in the US. We would have processed those image, images, detect everything that's changed, and then issued alerts to the world that this particular object at that particular place has changed in brightness. And so that 60 second latency from closing the shutter meant that we had to have high precision, high speed fiber optic networks uh, within Chile getting off the mountain down to La Serena, then out of South America, uh, coming in through Miami in the US to our, our principal processing facility, which was at the University of Illinois. We also have parallel processing facilities in France uh, and now in California and in the UK. So we had to get all that data there. So we had to do, uh, develop these fiber optic networks. A lot of dark fiber existed at the time, so we could make use of it. Uh, but this was also a challenge. Uh, and then we, we have these obviously large data processing facilities to analyze all these data. data. It's a petascale supercomputing system, uh, 10 to the 15th floating point operations per second. 
Uh, and um, that is done initially at the University of Illinois, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. Uh, and then during operations, we'll actually move that facility to SLAC uh, in California. Uh, and there'll be several data access centers where astronomers all over the world uh, can download our catalogs, query our catalogs, acquire the images of objects they want to study and carry out their astronomical analyses. There are actually three kinds of data processing that, uh, that we do. That's a big part of the construction cost of this facility. We issue what we call prompt data products which are the real-time differencing of the images, the, the latest image against the template for that part of the sky to detect everything that's changed. And that produces something like 10 million time domain events per night. So 10 million alerts per night are transmitted uh, to basically brokers that handle those data and, and notify astronomers around the world to, to what's happened. So the issue is not uh, detecting the changes and alerting it. The issue is how do you deal with 10 million events per night? Uh, this is not something that you're gonna take on your cell phone. And so, um, the real, so the question then is most of those things that have varied might be relatively mundane objects. Turns out most of them are asteroids, but for some people that's very exciting science and I'll come to that. Um, but for others, they wanna detect the really rare events like, um, like new kinds of stellar explosions. So part of the problem then is how do you discriminate uh, the kinds of variations that are more routine things that you're familiar with from the really exciting stuff that you might wanna follow up in another observatory. As I mentioned, most of the things that vary are actually asteroids that have moved to a different part of the sky. So to distinguish those, we actually have to determine that, that an object is an asteroid, uh, and we have to determine what its orbit is so that when we take a, a subsequent exposure and that object appears there, we know that it's the asteroid rather than something else new that appeared at that particular, um, that particular location. Uh, and so we will develop a detailed orbit catalog for something like 6 million solar system bodies um, within 24 hours of detecting the objects. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. And then every year we'll process all of the images that we've taken and we'll produce these extremely deep catalogs. As I mentioned, those catalogs over the 10 years will contain about 37 billion objects, 20 billion galaxies, 17 billion stars. And we'll actually do force photometry. So we'll look at locations that there once was a, a star and when that star has disappeared, uh, we'll determine upper limits for the brightness. So there'll be something like 7 trillion measurements uh, and 30 trillion force source measurements. So enormous databases here. Um, there will be 11 of these annual data releases uh, released annually roughly over the 10 years. And we built uh, computer tools to make it easy, not only for professional astronomer, astronomers, but also interested members of the public uh, to access those, uh, those databases and to perform the kinds of queries that they're interested in. Now, this, these two upper boxes are what we produce by the project, but to do science, there's a lot of other software that um, will be required. And that's out there developed by the community, the broad user community for this observatory. Uh, and so we have a requirement on ourselves that we produce a user-friendly environment to incorporate that code uh, that individual astronomers or groups of astronomers themselves are providing. And so that we know already of a number of tools, advanced tools that are being developed by scientific collaborations to use this facility and they're interfacing with our own software tools. Um, now I mentioned the science for, for Ruben is very broad, but there have been four driving uh, goals that uh, we flowed down the requirements. We determined the science requirements for and flowed them down. Uh, and I'll talk about each of these briefly in the remainder of the talk. So the first involves uh, studying these, these new uh, mysteries in physics and fundamental physics associated with dark matter and dark energy. And there are various techniques that we can use to, uh, to probe those, 
uh, those phenomena. Uh, cataloging moving objects in the solar system, including potentially hazardous asteroids, near Earth objects, and other kinds of uh, uh, solar system objects like comets, comets or trans Neptunian objects, et cetera. Um, we'll also make fundamental measurements about the structure and evolution of the Milky Way. Uh, the uh, evolutionary history will determine new spatial maps of stellar characteristics out to much larger distances than have been done before. And we'll also detect tidal streams. And I'll say more about that later. And then finally, the sort of newest kind of uh, most open-ended aspect of the science is just looking at things that go bump in the night, just detecting everything that changes in brightness. We call that exploring the transient uh, sky. And we'll discover new classes of variable stars, supernovae, um, and we'll fill in um, the uh, gaps that we have in our information, even about known variable systems. So let me just touch on each of these topics. Uh, first off, um, dark matter. So we actually will see dark matter, even though it doesn't interact electromagnetically and it doesn't emit light. So how do we see dark matter? And the reason we can do that is using a technique uh, called gravitational lensing. So Einstein's theory of gravity, which is called the theory of general relativity, um, tells us that uh, mass concentrations uh, in, in the universe not only attract other mass, they also attract light. So that as light passes around massive concentrations of matter, it gets bent in its trajectory. And um, that's a kind of lensing technique, which is not that different from lensing that occurs with, with glass, with, you know, with individual glass lenses that you're familiar with. For example, if you, if you have wallpaper in your house and you hold a wine glass up to that wallpaper, you have no problem detecting that wine glass because it distorts the background pattern of the wallpaper, just due to the fact that the glass bends the light that is passing through it. The glass itself is transparent. You're not actually seeing the glass. What you're seeing is a distortion of the background field. And we can do the same thing in astronomy um, by using gravitational lensing and looking at galaxies that lie behind the lens. Uh, and so this is a simulated image, but it illustrates the basic idea. So there's a pattern of galaxies on the sky. And if there's a mass concentration, in this case, a simulated cluster of galaxies in front, then the light from the background galaxies gets distorted. And in the purest cases, you can get complete rings, which are called Einstein rings. But in most cases, you see that galaxies are sheared into arcs, if you like. So when the distortion is this large, we call that strong gravitational lensing. But if you look at even the edges of this picture, you'll notice that there are kind of systematic alignments of the orientations and the shapes of the background galaxies. That's called weak gravitational lensing. And statistically, we can use that again to infer that there was a mass concentration here. So that's a way of detecting dark matter. We, taste it, we basically take images of large numbers of galaxies. We look for distortions of those galaxies or more specifically correlations between the shapes and the orientations of individual galaxies. And that tells us that there's intervening dark matter. But what about dark energy? Dark energy is an even more mysterious phenomenon. So the term goes back to um, the early 2000s. And it refers to the fact that at the end of the 1990s, it was determined that the universal expansion is actually accelerating. Now we've known since the days of Hubble that the universe is expanding. That's, that's nothing new. Uh, what was new is, is the determination that it's not only expanding, it's getting faster in that expansion, it's accelerating. And that's quite, contradictory to you know, ordinary common sense. The reason is that if you think about it, everything in the universe is massive uh, and there are gravitational forces between all of those things and they're attractive. So everything in the universe should be pulling on everything else in the universe. 
But if the universe is expanding, then we would expect that that attractive force should retard that expansion. So we would expect the expansion to be slowing down in time or decelerating. And in fact, it was determined um, that it was accelerating. So this was such a surprising discovery. Um, it occurred in the late 1990s. It resulted in a Nobel Prize to Saul Perlmutter, Adam Rees, and, um, and Brian Schmidt, three males, incidentally, three white males, in 2011. Uh, but again, it was a very well-deserved Nobel Prize because it's really changed our view of physics. And as I said, this is, this is um, contrary to expectations due to the gravitational attraction of all the matter. However, it turns out that Einstein's theory of general relativity showed that there can be acceleration of the entire universe if the universe is filled with a energy field that has negative pressure. I won't go into the reasons why that's true, but it turns out that that's true. So there's no conflict with general relativity. We just need to posit the existence of this mysterious energy field. Uh, and that energy field has been called dark energy. It turns out that um, various sort of theories of fundamental particle physics expect, uh, they, they actually predict the existence of an energy field like this. The problem is that they're off by many, many, many orders of magnitude in the value of that energy field. Uh, naively, those theories would predict that the dark energy, energy density is something like a hundred orders of magnitude larger than is observed. And so that's a pretty bad prediction. Uh, as for dark matter, we have no idea what dark energy is. It's another of the current mysteries of modern physics and therefore a very high priority for further study. So how do you measure dark energy? Well, the only way we know is to make increasingly precise measurements of the cosmic expansion history. And the Rubin Observatory will enable three ways of doing this. Uh, first off, we can measure what we call the brightness of standard candles as a function of redshift or a function of how far away they are. Uh, and there's a particular class of exploding star called type 1a supernovae uh, that we believe are at least calibratable standard candles. We know how intrinsically bright they should be. So we measure how bright they actually are, then we can get an idea of their distance. And it's the correlation of distance with redshift, which is what tells us how the universe is expanding. Another approach, um, again, we could do with the same data, is to measure standard rulers as a function of redshift. So this, this corresponds to something whose length, absolute length, you believe you know. And then you can see how large an angular size it has as a function of redshift. And that behavior how large is its angular size for a fixed length as a function of distance, again, tells you the distance. And there's a, a kind of very interesting phenomenon that occurred in the early universe called baryon acoustic oscillations. And we believe this has a characteristic distance. It leads to, leads to a correlation scale in the distribution of galaxies. We can measure that very well. And this gives us a measure of the expansion history. But another newer technique, which is really exciting, is by measuring something called the growth of structures as a function of redshift. So the universe started out extremely homogeneous and smooth, but very slight over concentrations of mass in the early universe attracted other mass because gravity is an attractive force. And that led to a process called gravitational instability where slightly overmassive regions of space grew larger and the slightly under dense regions of space grew, grew sparser. And that eventually was responsible gravitational instability for giving rise to the first stars in the universe and eventually the first galaxies and an even larger structures called clusters of galaxies. And that process of gravitational instability is simple Newtonian physics. We understand how it works. We can model it very accurately, but the universe is expanding underneath it. So as these structures are trying to collapse, the universe is stretching space-time out in opposition. And so that process gives us a very good handle on how the universe was expanding as a function of time, and therefore a very precise measurement of the acceleration. 
That's a new technique. It requires enormous numbers of galaxies to measure it well. And that's why the Rubin Observatory uh, will really give the new unique information on that using gra uh, weak gravitational lensing and by counting galaxies and measuring their correlations directly. So with the same data that we'll acquire, we will actually enable each of these different methods uh, and we can check for their consistency and, uh, and get the most precise constraints ever obtained on dark energy and dark matter. Okay, let me, let me come closer to home now and talk a little bit about the solar system uh, and in particular uh, measuring all these asteroids. Um, so this is a, a plot of known asteroids measured with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey as a function of their distance from the sun in astronomical units and the sign of the inclination of their orbit, which is measured relative to the equatorial plane, um, uh, the solar system equatorial plane. And each of these dots represents an, an asteroid and the colors are false colors, obviously, but they're meaningful in that objects that have similar spectra or similar composition uh, are shown with the same color. And so, as you can see, if you plot all these objects on a plot like that, there are families of asteroids that fall together, but objects of the same color are also distributed all over the plot. But now for every object on this plot, you know its orbit. So you can trace that or orbit forward in time, but you can also trace it backward in time. And when you do that, you find that, for example, all these blue points coalesce at some earlier point in the solar system history. And the reason for that is that most of the small objects in the solar system were produced by fractionation. They were produced by bigger things colliding into one another, breaking into pieces, and then each of the pieces goes on its own orbit through the solar system as an independent body. So by doing these kinds of studies, we can actually trace out the history of the solar system back to very early times. Uh, and, and how these larger objects collided and produced the population of small bodies that we see today. Another very interesting, perhaps even more interesting element of asteroids is looking for those that could actually do damage on Earth, what we call potentially hazardous asteroids. So these are objects uh, whose orbits once determined uh, look like they could potentially impact the Earth's surface itself. And what's plotted here is a scale where on the horizontal axis is the brightness, but we can convert that to the size of the asteroid itself. So at the bottom here, this is a 10 kilometer asteroid, a one kilometer asteroid, um, a 100 meter asteroid, and a 10 meter asteroid, et cetera. And if you, and then you can also convert that size or their brightness to the energy that would be released in an impact if an object of that size hit the earth. And the, the unit for that impact energy is megatons. So you can see the largest asteroids we know of, if they hit the earth, would be a hundred million megaton bomb. That's megatons of TNT. That would be a catastrophic event for the earth. And obviously, as you go to the smaller ones, then the importance of the impact gets a lot less. And so it's plotted as the number of such asteroids as a function of these sizes. Now, when you plot up what we know about asteroids, you get a distribution which is essentially a power law on this log log scale. So not surprisingly, there are many, many, many more small asteroids than there are large ones. Um, and it follows roughly this, this kind of power law distribution. On the red line here, we've shown our current knowledge of these asteroids, not, not the statistics, but the actual knowing where the objects are. And as you can see, we pretty much have very good knowledge of the large ones. Not surprisingly, they're bright, they're easy to trace. And so we know about all these guys. If any of them were gonna hit the earth, that would be pretty catastrophic but we know where they are. And right now there's nothing projected in the foreseeable future. As you get to the small end, we know very little of that. Remember this is a log scale. So, so there are something like 
a hundred thousand times more small asteroids than we have actually detected or know where they are. But at the very small end here, you know, these are a few meters in size. Most of those objects will burn up in the Earth's atmosphere if they were actually going to impact here. So they don't really cause damage. So the real interest is right here in this sweet spot, which is about a hundred meters. And those objects are large enough that they can permeate the atmosphere uh, and do a lot of damage on Earth. Um, but we still have very incomplete knowledge of where these things are and what's out there. And so this is really the concern. And um, there was in fact a congressional mandate passed in the late 90s to say that NASA should strive to identify all the asteroids down to about hundred meters in size and determine their orbits to give us advance notice of what would happen. Um, and as you can see, we haven't really met that yet, but the Rubin Observatory will get us essentially all of the way there. So this is something good we can do for society. Now, what would happen if one of these things hit? Actually, as you know, most of the Earth's surface is covered with water through the oceans. So the most likely thing is not that the asteroid would fall on Los Angeles or fall on Manhattan, um, but that it would fall into the ocean, that's still quite bad because it would lead to worldwide tsunamis, which it would have major effects on coastal cities. So this is very much a concern for, for civilization generally. Um, and this shows you sort of how far we can get uh, with the Rubin Observatory. So this is the distance uh, of potential asteroids that we can detect. Uh, versus the size that we can detect down here. This is that congressional mandate that I was telling you that we, we, we see all the, uh, uh, the objects that are uh, uh, larger than this size. And the, the various curves here depend a bit on what's called the albedo, how effectively the asteroids reflect sunlight. Uh, but the Rubin Observatory, as you can see, can get way, way down before below that goal um, all the way out to the main asteroid belt. And so our ability to catalog asteroids from this observatory is gonna be really fantastic. Okay, let me say a little bit about um, variability, time variability. Uh, this, is, this is an old chart actually showing kind of what we know about ordinary stars. So what's shown on the vertical axis here is, you know, the amplitude of variations as a function of the characteristic time scale of variations, you know, from where one here is, um, uh, or zero is, this is a log scale. So 10 to the zero is one. This would be one day, 10 days, 100 days, 1,000 days, et cetera. And this is how much the magnitude has changed. And as you can see, you know, we know a lot about different kinds of variable stars. They fall in clusters on this diagram. And so we can, make plots like this and determine what kinds of variable stars are out there. But the really interesting thing is, are the transient events, the rare events that are something very unusual uh, and that uh, can get very bright um, uh, and sometimes on quite short timescales. Uh, and this is a, a plot, again, sort of characteristic brightness of the variation as a function of the characteristic timescale again, shows what we know about transient objects. So these are core collapse supernovae, um, luminous blue variables, uh, classical novae, various different categories of, of stellar explosions that we know about. And you'll notice that this part of the diagram, which we filled with a caption, there's nothing really there. The reason there's nothing really there is not because there are no real objects that vary that much on such a short time scale. It's because we've never really looked. And this is the part of this diagram that the Rubin Observatory will fill in. So we will see faint things that explode, which are likely to be very far away, distant galaxies, that, and that have very short time scales for explosion, uh, which means that they were really truly catastrophic or cataclysmic events. So that's really new. This Wiki transient factory that you heard about two weeks ago will start this. Rubin Observatory will go about uh, four or five magnitudes fainter. So a much larger volume of space will be probed for exploding stars. Uh, and that'll be really new science and is ripe for discovery. 
And then the last topic I'll talk about is studying stars in the Milky Way. Um, this is a plot showing what we call metallicity, which is you know, how, what the abundances of heavy, heavy elements look like for stars as a function of their position in the galaxy. And you can clearly see the disk of the galaxy, the halo and the sort of extended disk. So uh, this is an important kind of measurement to make. But one of the problems that has limited it to date is we don't know the distances to most stars in the sky. Uh, we, it's, it's easy to measure their positions and take spectra, but it's hard to get the absolute distance. The most reliable technique we use is stellar parallax, which you're probably familiar with, where the Earth revolves around or orbits the sun, and that shift in position of the Earth causes a slight angular motion of a distant star by measuring how much that angular position changes as the earth goes around the sun we can determine its absolute distance and we've done that routinely out to distances of parsecs 10 parsecs etc with the rubin observatory since we'll have these thousand visits of every part of the sky we'll be able to make that measurement down to milli arc seconds thousandths of an arc second and so we'll be able to determine stellar distances out to a few hundred parsecs, which is pretty much out of the galaxy. So way out on a diagram like this. Uh, and this just gives you an indication. This is the previous diagram uh, for the Rubin Observatory. We will take this figure out to something like 200 kiloparsecs, um, which, you know, which will enable us to really map the outer regions of the galaxy in a detail that has never been done before. And the other interesting thing that happens when you do that is you can detect what are called tidal streams. So these are associated with small counterparts to the galaxy, which over cosmic time have fallen into the Milky Way. And as they fall in, tidal forces strip out the stars in those galaxies and they leave a trail. So the largest and most obvious of these is called the Sagittarius stream but there are other smaller ones that you can see that have already been detected um, with Sloan and with other surveys. And uh, Rubin Observatory will dramatically increase the number of tidal streams that are observed. Uh, and from that, we'll get not only a history of how the Milky Way was formed by accreting smaller objects in its vicinity, but we'll also get a much more detailed map of the dark matter concentration of the galaxy because these tidal streams really trace out the orbit of something falling into the Milky Way. So they're very sensitive to the gravitational field of the Milky Way, which is dominated by dark matter. Uh, let me, before closing, let me just say a word about COVID-19 and the impacts it's had on this project. It's been an especially interesting year uh, and a half. Um, we've been trying to build this billion dollar facility in the midst of a global pandemic. Uh, and that's not without its challenges, particularly because we have people working on the project all over the world. So every, every element of the, of the world's dealing with COVID-19 has affected us. We had to shut down all work in Chile in March 2020. We're able to get things back at Slack in May of 2020, and we got back underway in Chile in the fall of 2020, but with a limited team. Um, and our prime contractors are European. So the dome contractors, Italian, telescope mount contractors, Spanish, they both went home in March of 2020. We only were able to get them back on site in about February. And since then we've been working hard to maintain the schedule. So all in all, we've lost about 19 months due to COVID, which is, you know, which is upsetting, but, but, but we're, we can deal with it. So let me then summarize. The Vera Rubin Observatory will initiate a new era in survey astronomy with major impacts on a wide variety of fields. Project's been technically challenging to build, but we're well on track. Uh, we were well on track before COVID-19 hit us. And nevertheless, we expect to um, begin the 10 years of operations in just, just two or three years. We have a very dedicated construction team and a large and diverse scientific community. Uh, and we all eagerly await completion. Uh, so let me stop there and I'll stop sharing and see if there are any questions. Professor Kahn, thank you very much. Let's 
let's take questions. Turn on your microphones and. Uh, okay. okay. There are going to be tons of questions. Uh, let me ask one that's probably the most obvious to docents, and that is uh, to ask the size of the lenses as part of this telescope. We have always said, based on the glass that was available to Alvin Clark, that the largest lens you could build is something like 40, 41 inches, based on the strength of the glass itself to resist bending. Uh, there may be new glasses, so maybe that's not valid anymore. How large are your lenses? Yeah, so the entrance lens to the camera is about five and a half feet. So that is about 66 inches. So it violates your theorem. <laughs> okay. And it's a, it's a, um, it's a relatively thin lens given its diameter. So that was indeed challenging to make. There's nothing especially unique about the glass, but um, the, the ability to polish large lenses and to control their figure while you're assembling them uh, has improved over the years. So this lens um, was the, the effort to build the lenses was led by Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, which uh, has a lot of experience making large optics for the National Ignition Facility High Power Laser. And those lenses have to be very pure and very accurate to avoid exploding when they're bombarded with a laser beam. Um, and the, the actual contractors involved, Ball Aerospace had the prime contract. And um, there's, there's a, a small company in Tucson which actually did the figuring. And the glass came from Corning for those lenses. Yeah. But they're finished now and they met their figure requirements. So <laughs> it's no longer a question. So if nobody else jumps in, I'll, I'll try another one. On your analogy of the wine glass and gravitational lensing, uh, dark matter is dark. I don't know if the right term is isentropic or not, but is I wouldn't think dark master, matter would be um, isotropic or consistent or homogeneous because one of the theories about uh, star and galaxy formation is that they that they bent space and time and then regular matter began to fill in based on the bends but I still don't know if we know the shape of it or and the second the follow-on to that would be do you think that dark energy would have similar properties or be, or if we could even detect those kinds of structural variations? Right, so, so let, me, let me take that. So first, dark matter, we believe, was created isotropically or homogeneously across the early universe. Um, but as I mentioned, it does interact gravitationally which means it's subject to its own gravitational instability. Dark matter particles attract themselves. And so if you have a slight excess of dark matter particles in one area, it will attract others. So in the current day, you're right, the current thinking is that dark matter, gravitational instability in dark matter was responsible for the for formation of the first structures, the first clumps. And then those clumps grew with time to become you know, really significant clustering and, and clumping of dark, dark matter in the current universe. It's isotropic in that we expect that we see similar structures if we look in different directions, but the distribution itself is inhomogeneous in that it's clustering. And those dark matter concentrations then attracted baryons and the normal things that make up ordinary matter and gave rise to the birth of stars and galaxies, et cetera. Coming back to your question about dark energy, dark energy is believed to be an energy field with negative pressure, which means that it characteristically wants to expand. As the universe expands, you actually get more dark energy. And so it is not subject to the same kind of gravitational instability. And for everything we know currently, it's assumed that dark, dark energy is fairly homogene homogeneous, but we don't really know what it is. So there's an open question. And there are experiments that people are trying to construct to see if there might be clumping in dark energy that we could actually detect in the laboratory. 
Thank you. So I have a question about the, the slewing and settling time of five seconds. Right. When, when you uh, are you making large motions, large slews? Aren't you going just very slowly across the sky? Why do you need what seems to me to be a relatively long slewing and settling time? Is it just the inertia of, of once you start moving, you need that five seconds period? Yeah, so what, what happens is we typically, or the baseline plan is to do two 15 second exposures back to back in the same spot. So we point to a new part spot in the sky, we do two 15 second exposures, and then we slew to another part of the sky. And typically we're slewing to a, another part of the sky, which is at least three or four degrees away because it's distinct from the previous one. So every 30 seconds, we have to take this large telescope and slew it a few degrees. And we don't want to waste five sec more than five seconds in that slew. Otherwise, we're really interrupting with our observing because we really want to get into a pattern of doing observations every 15 seconds. So the five seconds is an upper limit. Our current projections based on the constructed telescope are more like a few seconds. So we'll do a little bit better than that. But it's obvious why we don't want to do worse than that. And it isn't a continuous slew. It is a step slew. And that's why the settling is an issue. Yeah. Other questions? Other questions? Um, Has there well, been uh, yeah. any thought given to uh, a northern hemisphere version of the Vera Rubin telescope? Yeah, it's it's. It's come up in the, the years we've been constructing this. So there, there was a, at one point a desire expressed by the Korean astronomical community to clone, to clone our facility and to put it in the Northern Hemisphere um, in Asia. But they eventually abandoned that plan. And, and actually, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense. I mean, it would be nicer to say that we, we were surveying the entire sky but with a ground-based facility, it's, it's hard to see the entire sky um, from any point on earth. And, um, and as it turns out, it's not that important because we believe the universe on very large scales is pretty isotropic and pretty homogeneous. And so we'll get 20 billion galaxies um, from a statistical sense, having a Northern hemisphere survey would only improve the statistics by the square root of two. So it wouldn't do a lot. Now, in, in earlier phases of astronomy, of course, it was very important where the telescope is. And that's because if you're not looking out so faint, then your astronomy is governed by the nearer objects to, to the solar system. And so, you know, there's a big difference between Northern Hemisphere astronomy and Southern Hemisphere astronomy if you're looking at the Milky Way. But once, uh, once a lot of your science is focused on more distant galaxies, there's not a lot of difference. So at this point, there's, there's not any thoughts to a Northern version of this. Thank you. Well, we are- So I, are, I have a- Okay. Sorry, quick question. Again. Please, I, I was ahead. wondering what, what could be the impact on the project of the, um, the, these sort of growing satellite constellations? Very good question, and that's something we've been dealing with over the last couple of years. So um, we are the largest field of view facility in optical astronomy that anybody's building. So the, the satellites, the, these are things like Starlink satellites and others that, uh, you know, that people, OneWeb and other companies have been talking about, um, will for sure come across our field. And you know the projections are a little bit uncertain, but there's talk about between fifty thousand and hundred thousand satellites or so, and they cause streaks. Now, even in the most dire projections, the streaks themselves occupy only a few percent of our pixels. You know, over the lifetime, it's 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 not it's not like our entire fields are are brightened out by satellites. But a few percent is still a few percent. And what's more pernicious about it is that they're bright and there are echo effects that are caused by, um, by ghosts and by um, um, 
uh, coupling and electronic coupling in the sensors um, crosstalk that yield images of those streaks at other points in the field. And so it is an issue for us. Now we've been working with SpaceX and with Starlink directly to, you know, to study how to minimize this. The problem is worse in higher orbit. So because the objects are up longer in the night and at least for the Starlink satellites, they, they're a problem around twilight um, in the early, early evening and in around dawn when they're still in our field and, and yet they, they can see the sun and get illuminated by the sun. Uh, once the satellite is in the shadow of the earth, we don't see very much from it. And there are a variety of techniques they can undertake to, to decrease the reflectivity of the satellites. Actually, what you really want to do is to increase the reflectivity uh, and make it a very shiny surface because then the reflection of the sunlight is specular. And most of the time it's not pointing at the telescope. And so we've been working with SpaceX to do this and they've made improvements there. So we're optimistic. Um, the problem is all the other potential satellite vendors in the world may not be quite so conscientious about astronomy. And so there is some pressure um, both in the US government and also in, uh, in, in world fora in terms of treaties and things to try to produce some requirements or regulations about the optical properties of large numbers of artificial satellites. But so far there's nothing that's been agreed to. So this is really an unregulated uh, area right now. Well, we are we are running almost almost to an hour and a half, and um, I really don't want to abuse uh, Professor Khan's <clears throat> Professor Khan's time, and and. I do appreciate it. Professor Khan, thank you very much. Everybody, wonderful presentation. Let me bring the meeting to an end by briefly mentioning our next speaker, two weeks on Saturday, August 28th. Greenway Talks are online, will continue with a presentation by Dr. Abby Iswas, Group Supervisor in Optical Communication Systems at JPL. His topic will be NASA's Deep Space Optical Communications Project and the upcoming mission to the asteroid 16 Psyche, during which ESOC, as it is known, will demonstrate the first laser-based optical communications link operating at interplanetary distances. In his talk, Dr. Diswas will tell us about work now being done to ready the 200-inch Hale telescope for its new role as the ground receiving station in this initial test of the technology. So again, thank you, Professor Khan, and my thanks to everybody who attended today. I appreciate your support, appreciate your help with the, this series. And with that, I'll close the meeting and we'll see you on August 28th. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Wonderful. Bye-bye.